Good morning, everybody. It's time for On Texas Football Great. Rapid Reactions, uh, brought to you by our friend Adam Lowy at the Lowy Law Firm. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Jerry Hamilton and C.J. Vogel. Uh, good Sunday morning to you guys. Uh, we're here going to talk a little bit about the things that we picked out uh, post-game uh, that we wanted folks to think about and that we thought about uh, from last night. Uh, guys, let's start, uh, obviously, with the elephant in the room, Quinn Ewers and his injury. Uh, your immediate feedback on that. Uh, Quinn went 14 of 16 on the night uh, and then also had two touchdowns. He did have the one pick, 185 yards total. Uh, bad injury luck, Jerry. You said this uh, last night as well uh, for Quinn. He's had some just bad injury luck in his time at Texas. He has. I mean, a late, essentially a late hit and pile drive by uh, Dallas Turner, which should have been a flag. Uh, against Alabama in 2022. Um, last year, uh, Nelson Caesar blows up. JT Sanders hits Quinn on the bra uh, on the backside. Uh, that that sent him in, uh, set him off or, uh, with that injury. I mean, he got hit on a handoff, essentially, is what happened, right? The, uh, the, the, the UTSA defensive lineman went, to hit, went and hit Quinn on the handoff, thinking maybe he was going to keep that ball or whatnot. Those are three tough luck injuries. We're not talking about a guy that has a, a non-contact ACL here or something weird, you know. It, we're talking about three just tough luck injuries for a quarterback, and, and it makes it tough. You know, the thing that sucks for me is you know how much it means for Texas Quinn to play at Texas. You've seen the emotion come out of him as he's gotten older uh, and more experienced at Texas and more comfortable in his own skin, I would say. Now, you know, and this is three years in a row that kind of feels like it gets zapped a little bit. And and his season's not over, obviously. We don't know if he's going to miss a game or two games or whatnot. Uh, but it just sucks to see because the guys, you know, he gives it his all at Texas. And to have tough luck injuries three years in a row that's going to cost him time on some level is just really unfortunate. Quinn's playing his best football right now. I, I've got to say this as it relates to, to uh, Quinn. 14 of 16. For 185, and he played a quarter and a half. Yeah, yep. <laughs> he was rolling, guys. Uh, he was rolling uh, and going to, to to really do some damage. Uh, CJ, what did what did you hear post game uh, last night uh, from from Quinn and or Sark that led you to think where this whole situation was right now with him and uh, his av availability potentially next week, the week after, et cetera. Yeah, I talked to a source close to the program that kind of indicated it wasn't too serious. And we heard that from Sarkeesian afterwards as well. And uh, I, I don't want to say it was a lighthearted Quinn Ewers afterward. No one wants to be injured, right? And no one wants to have uh, a game like this against UTSA, another in-state school cut short. But it wasn't, you know, that that dreaded injury luck that we've been seeing and what it, it didn't give off the vibe of being a, a long-term thing which is a very positive uh, uh thing to mention here of course when you look down the road and see oklahoma in four weeks right of course that gives you some some time to get him right get him completely back up to speed before your two biggest games of the year and then uh, back to back there so uh, it it doesn't sound too serious i would be very surprised if we saw quinn against ulm i'd be very surprised if we saw him against mississippi state with the way that the, the Bulldogs are looking right now. However, again, I think you have to look at it in the side that it's not a long-term or at least not expected to be a long-term lingering issue right now. And fortunately for Texas, you have a heck of a backup quarterback in QB2 that you can rely on to keep that offense moving in the right direction. I, I got to I gotta say this. Uh, I, I'm a little disappointed because it does hurt his uh, likely Heisman chances if it's an extended uh, exit. Uh, if he comes back next week, though, all bets are off. Uh, but he was rolling 14 of 16, 185. Yes, he had the pick uh, that I don't know what went wrong on that, yeah. but two touchdowns. Uh, he's improved this year in the red zone. Incredible. Uh, yeah, he's really, really improved. Uh, the, the toss to Wisner, uh, where he kind of bought himself some time and found Trey Wisner in the flat on a kind of a leaking route out to the side. I think was indicative of his growth as a quarterback Absolutely. Just as much as many others uh, when he did that last night. Hey, hey guys, Bobby, uh, if I can add to that, the game plan, obviously, without Jaden Blue, we knew Quinn was going to have to shoulder a lot more of this offense, right? 
How about nine of your first 10 play calls from Steve Sarkeesian were passes? How about 16 of the first 20 plays were passes? One of those, of course, was a pass play in which Quinn ran on a third and eight, uh, picked up six or seven. But you saw the mentality there that Steve Sarkeesian said, yeah, you know, we should beat UTSA, but we're going to rely on our, our Heisman level quarterback here to get the job done. And, you know, 14 of 16 is a pretty darn good start there, of course, before the injury. And of course, you should expect him to return to that level when he does come back at some point this year. All right. Uh, good stuff there, guys. Uh, next topic I wanted to hit on was Arch. Uh, because I end up, I mean, look, he played 24 plays, guys, and had five touchdowns. <laughs> That's a ridiculous figure by anybody. Uh he sputtered two series at the end of the first half, and then he sputtered uh, one series in the second half only after a failed reverse to Silas Boulder. Otherwise, a young man uh, had a, a whale of a, a night last night, uh, finished 9 of 12 for 233 yards, also had a long touchdown run, the longest run from a Texas quarterback uh, for a TD since Vince Young. Um Pretty strong. And it's not like Sam Ellinger didn't try. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like we didn't see Tyrone Swoops try to run the ball. Uh, he, he's got some serious wheels. Um, Jerry, I want to, I think everybody saw all of that, but I want to come back to something that you said, and that's that you think it could be a blessing in disguise that Arch got to see so much time in a, at a time when the game, it wasn't completely out of hand when he, when he stepped in. He certainly made it get out of hand, though. Yeah, look, the injuries suck, but so you kind of look ahead. Okay, what does this mean for Texas? If Quinn, if Quinn doesn't play next week, this becomes one of those things that's a blessing in disguise because Sark, AJ Milwee, and and and, and Arch, uh, Sark, Arch, and AJ Milwee build a game plan around him. That, that we didn't think was going to happen going into this season. We had talked about how Quinn had to stay healthy, but he faced adversity, right? They got him on a corner blitz and a nickel blitz on that third down. Two-minute drill did not go well. Um, it wasn't on him necessarily, but it just there was adversity in the half, Then he came out extremely strong, four or five for like 150 in the second half, right? But if they build a game plan and he gets to have a week as a starter and prepare as a starter – and goes out and executes a game plan, that could be a blessing in disguise for Texas. It's a long season. How many quarterbacks did we see go down yesterday in college football? I mean, yeah. five starters, I think, went down yesterday. For one, some for a season, some maybe for a game. But this is a blessing in disguise now that it's happened for Texas if Arch starts next week and they can build a game plan around him. And as important as the Arch game plan, it's the team executing a game plan around Arch in case that has to happen again later in the season. Hey, CJ, I ask you this. What are your overall thoughts on Arch on Saturday night? I mean, uh, I asked Jerry about the adversity part and and also the the blessing in disguise, the idea that this gives Texas a chance to, to really dig into what he can do better for later down the season in case Quinn were to get injured again. Uh, but – to me, I go back to the fact that he played 24 plays and scored five touchdowns. <laughs> I mean, that is just an insane rate. And I know the quality of competition matters. We we both know that. But it's just pretty darn impressive. It absolutely is. I mean, I, I don't know how you get more efficient than that, right? You know, and you saw the two drives that sputtered at the first half. And I think that's a great – Sarkeesian said that the fumble by Jarrett Gibson was a great learning curve. I think that's that sack that – Arch took at the end of that first half, also a great learning curve for him. Of course, that uh, kind of the pocket awareness or, or, or time that you have running down in your yeah. head as a quarterback to be hit there, hold on to the football, and then come back to the sideline and very quickly diagnose why the play failed or what he yeah. saw and why the sack was taken. That's all positives for me. And Sarkeesian highlighted that in the press conference as well as yeah, he, he kind of knew right away what the issue was. And for, for him to know that, you know, uh, two drives, three drives into being the guy now. That 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 speaks volumes into his football IQ. But my goodness, Bobby, I mean that uh, the explosivity for that Texas offense with Arch Manning at the helm of that that offense, it was incredible, right? And I don't have the the numbers by me, but I, I would assume that 
the 20 plus play, uh, you know, yardage and gains by the Texas offense is north of 10 with Arch at the quarterback spot. And that's even including the running game, obviously. Well, stepping in and scoring two touchdowns on the first three plays, he was on the field. That helps. And of course, then you start to see the, the sputter and then you start to see him find his rhythm in that second half. Once he settled in, playing in front of 100,000 people at home, it's not an easy thing to do. My number one takeaway, everywhere that you looked, big plays were made on that Texas offense. And it, it was a well-oiled machine once the groove got going. Hey, Bobby, uh, can I, Bobby, can I add something to what CJ said? Because I think it's important here. Art said it last night in the postgame press conference, the audio that CJ got. He said it felt he said it was good to get hit again. Yes. He hasn't got hit in the back on a backside blindside blitz since he was a senior in high school. It's been almost two years. Jerry, who I was, was hitting him in the back then? He got hit. Not a, not a not a D1 UTSA kid who's been in college for three or four years, right? That's a different level in which the more that he gets comfortable, the more that you'll see that ceiling rise, which I mean, five touchdowns and 24 snaps. Yeah. It's a pretty high ceiling. Uh, all right, uh, before we go on and talk about the next thing we want to do uh, with uh, the rapid reactions here, uh, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. Uh, that is Adam Lowy of the Lowy Law Firm. If you've been injured in a car wreck, truck wreck, automobile accident of any kind, including motorcycle or ATV, give Adam and his group a chance to earn your business. LowyLawFirm.com. That's LowyLawFirm.com. Adam sponsors rapid reactions each and every week. Uh, we appreciate him very much. Guys, uh, we talk about all offense all we want. What about the Texas defense? Uh, they literally have only given up two touchdowns through three games. That's pretty darn strong uh, for uh, the Longhorns. They were particularly good on third downs on Saturday night. No, it was incredible. It, it What we've seen Texas and the PK and Nansen defense kind of develop into is one that is going to get off the field and make life very difficult for those explosive plays. And we saw that. It's really the first time this year that we've seen a, a, a bust, right? You know, uh, that 53-yard touchdown. It looked like the old Texas. It's not the Texas that we're going to continue seeing this year. You're allowing 6.3 points per game through three weeks. That's a tremendous mark right now. So uh, The Texas defense was – uh, stopped UTSA, uh, I mean, two of 17 on third downs. Tremendous. If you take away that 53-yard run on the on the touchdown, Texas was allowing under two yards per carry, Bobby, on 38 attempts. You thought this run defense, like we all kind of thought this. I don't mean to single you out, but this run defense was not expected to be where it was a year ago because you just lost the two best interior defensive linemen in the country, right? And all of a sudden, and I know there's a talent gap here, but they're showing it on tape right now of being an, an elite defense. And that's exactly what you would hoped with all these veterans and returners on the defensive side of the ball. Only one pass play exceeded 20 yards. It went for 22. Right now, that secondary is tremendous. One thing I do want to see more of, and I thought they were great at in the first two weeks, turnovers. I wanted to see a couple more turnovers. They finally got to the quarterback. Colin Simmons is going to be an all-world caliber player by, by the time it's all said and done. Um, but overall, if you're – Two for 17 on third down conversions. You're doing something right. I've got to say this because I, I think that uh, the second longest pass play uh, of Saturday night for uh, UTSA was at the end of the half where they dumped it down to the to the guy and just let him run. That yeah. was an 18-yard gain for UTSA. That was a stat pattern because there was no chance it was going anywhere. Uh, Jerry, what did you think of the Texas defense on Saturday? Yeah, so I thought they were they were going to play vanilla, right? They had some a little bit of depth issue with Jelani McDonald out at nickel and safety, right? They don't want they like John A. Barron at corner. They were they were vanilla up front, I thought, with their fronts. Um, they could have they could have played more games up front and and definitely I don't want to say decapitated, but pretty much the UTSA offense. But they didn't do that. Um, most of the issues in the run defense are more linebackers right now. If there's big plays that are given up, it's not really on the defensive line necessarily. It's more the leaky plays because the linebackers fall stepping, not reading keys. So I think those are correctable mistakes. Uh, that's the thing. And one thing I like, again, was they got to play a lot of guys up front. Alex January got snaps. Uh, Dre Bledsoe got snaps. Sadir so Mitchell, everybody got snaps. Is Vosick had a sack. Ethan Burke obviously played well. Everybody's remember the pick six, but he had a TFL, and he was in the backfield two or three other times. So they got to play a lot of guys up front, and I think that's important 
because look, you're not going to stay 100% healthy at that position all season long. It's not going to happen. It's too long of a season, too physical of a season coming up for Texas. So to get those guys the st- uh, the snaps they need uh, to get them some experience. But again, I think the best thing I've seen from the Texas defense, uh, Brian Robeson hit on it last night, and we've talked, all of us have talked about it connectivity in the secondary, communication and connectivity. How many big plays has the secondary given up this year? I mean, that's why Texas. we talk about Texas has given up two touchdowns. One was late against Michigan when the game was out of hand. Texas, if that game would have been close, Michigan wouldn't have scored that touchdown. So it's really one on a busted play. That You only do that if your secondary has great communication and you're connected. There hasn't been any big busts this year to give up the big plays. If that continues all season against this schedule, that's going to be really good for the Horns because they're not going to face big-time passing attacks on this schedule. So if they continue to be communicate really well and be connected, it's going to be difficult for teams whose strength isn't throwing the ball to have success truly throwing the ball. I think that's a great point, Jerry. And again, you look more down the line at this Texas schedule. Who is the big passing threat? We thought it would be Oklahoma, maybe Georgia with their dual balanced uh, approach. Uh, They didn't look great last night, that's for sure. Georgia squeaking out a 13-12 victory over Kentucky and continued issues at Oklahoma on the offensive side of the ball. I'm not sure who poses the largest threat right now. Still to say, Texas needs to go out there and do it. But when you have that secondary that gives you that safety blanket and that confidence in the back unit, ooh, that unleashes a lot up front. And right now, they're playing very well. You know, I I, want to – I, yes, the the I want to add this because it's something that I feel really strongly about. Um, yes, the the touchdown run came because of a misstep by the linebacker, but this linebacker unit is tackling at a high level right now. Yeah. Um, I really think that they're actually and they're building depth along the way. Uh, not only did we see Anthony Hill, he led the team with eleven tackles, uh, but we saw Leonga Lafau get a, a, a sack. Uh, right. We saw Mo Blackwell and uh, also in on it. We saw Ty Anthony Smith uh, make a real nasty play on a fourth down. All right. And so I, I don't, I hear you all about the connectivity in the back end and I agree with it. Okay. I think that the whole defense seems to be playing together really well and playing complementary defense right now. Um, I, I was thinking about it, Vernon Broughton, uh, you know, have, he drew a, a holding penalty again on a guy on quarterback leaks out. He gets uh, gets uh, gets a guy to hold him. There's just a number of different things they're doing, you know that that is very difficult. I mean, they're they're leaning in to Colin Simmons getting around the edge. That means that you know if he doesn't get there, your other guy's got to be out there for the escape hatch, right? And so a lot of different things they're doing, and whether that's PK or Johnny Nansen or a combination of the both. I don't really care. I just yeah. know it's good for Texas. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Bobby, one one last thing on the holding. Texas has drawn eight holdings on defense so far this year. Uh, probably a bit more than you would have expected a year ago in the Big 12. Here's a, <laughs> the fun part of that. All eight are by individual unique players. So eight different Longhorn players have drawn a holding penalty, kind of showing how quick and agile and you know efficient they are to shed blocks at their – needing to be held. So I, I wanted to throw that out there. I've been keeping track this year. Yeah, that's a tremendous stat. All right, the last thing for rapid reactions here that we wanted to talk about, uh, we, we all three of us circled this, explosive plays. And I know CJ talked about it a little bit earlier, but really this is an explosive offense. It truly is. I mean, you talk about it, with Isaiah Bond running down the road. You talk about Gunnar Helm leaping a defender down the right sideline. Uh, you talk about Silas Bolden. Uh, he had he made a really nice kick re- or punt return that got called back. Oh. But, I mean, they just have so many. I mean, even Arch with his legs, big, long run. Um, Texas can come at you with speed and waves at just about every position on the field right now. And I I know we talk mostly about explosive plays on offense, but it literally right now feels like it's everywhere, whether it's Colin Simmons with his speed and making explosive play on defense, 
uh, Anthony Hill and his. I, I feel like uh, it's a broken record that we talked about, but um, this the Texas offense and the Texas defense, they've got some guys. And when you have dudes, you can make big plays, and, and that's what's happening right now. I think seven or eight players had plays over 15 yards last night. Seven or eight. I can't. I. I. I'll let CJ get to the exact stats. I. Bond, Helm, Arch, Wingo, Golden, Cook. I think one more. Maybe Bolden had one as well. So you're you're looking at seven or eight players made explosive offensive play, 15 yards or more. Right. So that in itself, pretty high end stuff. Then you go to explosive plays on defense, like you said, Colin Simmons, explosive play. I mean, so this is the most explosive playmakers. Texas has put on a football field in 20 years. Does that mean the end result's going to be the same? It doesn't. It's going to be harder never to win a national championship. And if we're three games into a season, and you got to see if you stay healthy and, and if the ball bounces your way in a couple of key situations. But we talked about this is the fastest team Sark's had. Fastest is not just 40 times. It's quickness. It's explosivity. It's smart football players that play faster than a 40 time. This is easily the fastest and most explosive team Sark's had at Texas. Um, and then now you added the arch QB run element to it. It got a le- even more explosive Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, t- to your point about explosive plays with, you know, seven to eight guys, 15 yard plays on offense, 12 tackles for loss, 11 different Texas Longhorns recorded a tackle for loss. So it's everywhere. You know, it's all three phases. And again, uh, I know that the, the turnovers might not show up, but you saw the sacks. You saw the pressure on the quarterbacks. Those turnovers will continue to be a big part of this Texas defensive identity. When you're able to completely flip a game in the way, and I know that Texas was already out to a big lead, but for Isaiah Bond to catch a, sh- a, a little bubble, catch the corner and go, that changes games. Big time games, that's a game, that's a play in which you look at it and say, okay, the, the complete complexion of what we thought this game was in, you know, kind of the trajectory of, we no longer believe that because of that individual effort, that individual play. Texas can do that at every position right now. And that was, again, going back to what Sarkeesian said last evening, every single as, uh, facet of our team on both sides of the ball is making plays right now. And that's all we can ask for at the moment. We will continue to get better as the season continues. But great sign through three weeks. And I want to add this. Jaden Blue didn't play last night either. <laughs> Perhaps the fastest player on the team, right? Yeah. Good stuff. That's a good reminder, Jerry, uh, for sure. But one thing I would I would add uh, about that, that play where Bond took took that uh, little outside screen or whatever, the, the corner tried to play through Matthew Golden and jacked him back about two yards. I guarantee you because of that play, the corner next time won't do that. No, right. uh, because once you put that on film, a guy then walks the safety like he did. They don't they're your cornerback coach of whatever team you may be. They're not going to tell you to play through Matthew Golden next time. Right. Uh, so that 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 even uh, has an impact beyond just this week uh, with them. All right, all right guys. Uh, final thoughts uh, on this uh, rapid reactions brought to you by our friend Adam Lowy at the Lowy Law Firm. Uh, guys, my 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 final thought is um, the first half, I literally thought Texas was just going to lose player after player <laughs> after player. It, it first, you know, Kelvin Banks go, goes down. He, he reentered the game. Manny Muhammad goes down. Quinn Ewers goes down. Jay is already on the shelf. Rod talked about this in the postgame. He was looking around in the first half at four of your top ten players in the program. Not healthy. That's not good going into conference play here in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the depth showed up eventually. And that was probably uh, – Trey Weisner got hurt. Yeah. They didn't even play him at all in the second half. And my point on all of this is that's why you recruit the way you do. That's why Texas is lucky to have recruited – not lucky, but fortunate. Yes, uh, who have recruited the way they do because now they have the depth to actually continue on a route. Yeah, that's, that's my point. What What about your lasting remembrance uh, of this game? Uh, either one of you. I'll, I'll I'll start and maybe it's just been the accumulation of three games, but the freshmen. 
you know, whether it be a Ryan Wingo, whether it be a Jarrett Gibson, whether it be a Colin Simmons, it, it's the stacking of talent. We Y'all have talked about it at length already this season, but to see the influx of new talent coming in to complement what is already existing on this roster, it's exactly what you want in a program that hopes to contend and compete for national championships. For the second game out, out of three so far, Jarrett Gibson's your leading rusher. You know, Colin Simmons, I can't speak enough good things about his ability to affect the passer in passing situations. Uh, again, two sacks in the last two games. I think he's combined for almost 15 pressures. But to see those guys, Ty Anthony Smith, add him to that list as well, because I don't think it'll be too long before you see him truly as a, a, a full-time rotational guy in this defense. It, it's really, really impressive. So, again, hat tip to Sark, to Brandon Harris, everybody on that recruiting side to get these classes where they need to go. Because let's not forget they had some pretty big recruits on campus again for that game last night. And I spoke to Michael Terry after the game and said, yeah, I don't know if I've ever been to a game like that. That was impressive. That, hey, that speaks to CDC, too, what he's done at Texas. Absolutely. It, it, it's a, you know, Jeff Trailer said in, in a press conference earlier in the week that it's like a rock concert in between every play. And while some of the fans may go, eh, the recruits like it. Okay, that's something. I, I, I'm going to take the bigger view of college football. And, Bobby, you've been saying it for two years. You don't have to worry about quarterback at the University of Texas as long as Sark is here. Wisconsin's got to worry about it. Florida State doesn't have one. Uh, South Carolina's got to worry about it. I mean, you just go down the list. How, oh, the quarterbacks that went down Saturday in the first games of the day and how that changed those games. Wisconsin had no chance to move the ball. South Carolina, no chance to move they the ball. They win that game. Yeah. NC State, Grayson McCall went down. I don't know if he came back, but it was a sluggish game. Texas can bring in Arch Manning. And I know it was against UTSA, but quarterback recruiting, quarterback recruiting gives you a chance. And then the other thing I would say is, look, there is – Brian Robeson said it last night in the postgame, and I thought it was very astute how the parody of college football. Kentucky gets blown out by South Carolina, takes Georgia to the wire, right? It takes them to the wire. And that's just – that just game right there in a nutshell tells you about college football. It's tough, but one for Texas in the future years. It's tough on the road in the SEC. Um, but then the other thing I would say is, is look, this team, even though we're we're chasing perfection because we talk about we have to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the staff's chasing perfection. This Texas team's going to continue to build confidence, and I think that's very important. Yeah, I I, I look at it, Jerry, and you talk about that, uh, Sark, not not being not missing a quarterback uh it's just so important because we we've suffered that and watched that as texas fans where you know it's not that those aren't good good uh longhorns etc it just wasn't there to a level of uh elite play and now texas is stacking those chips uh and when you stack them you can push them to the middle of the table yeah you know, and so that's what's happened. All right, guys, that's going to do it for rapid reactions today. Thanks again to Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. Thank you also to CJ Vogel, uh, as well as Jerry Hamilton. Uh, we will have more. We've got the offensive grades and defensive grades coming up today as well uh, for Jerry and CJ. Thanks for watching on Texas Football. Hook them. <laughs>